the technology is there. The hardest part is, is the social and the bureaucratic part, I guess. But in Canada, at least it's smaller than in the US. So maybe we actually have a better chance at instituting change faster. Okay, welcome back to the Saving Science video series. Uh, today, we will talk about new tools and standards that are in development to ensure or increase transparency and instill a research culture of replication. And so it'll be mostly pretty positive. Um, and we're not going to do a recap, but in the first five videos, we covered the different ways the academic system is broken, how it's broken at all levels and at each level broken in different ways. And But then when we started implementing straightforward changes to the standards of research, we received a lot more pushback than we anticipated. And the pushback got stranger and seemed to conflict with the basics of science, again, being transparency and replication as minimum standards. So that told us, told us that the system is potentially broken at an even deeper, more serious level. And so whatever new standards or systems are proposed, uh, those systems need to be able to to ensure integrity even among highly conflict-ridden uh, researchers, I guess. Right? And so it has to be kind of uh, bulletproof, but still not overly bureaucratic and overly complicated because there's already, there's already too much bureaucracy. And so... Um, yeah, I think that's a good recap, and we'll probably need two videos for the new standards and tools. But again, I'm trying to keep this as short as possible. Um, and so we'll jump right into the new transparency tools and standards. And so maybe we can go to the uh, Cured Science So Oh no So as mentioned, there's been Actually, maybe I, I'll go back to here. There's been many new initiatives and, and new tools that have been developed, and it's really exciting. I mean, so many that it's it's hard to keep track. But um, I've kind of organized them here as some of the main ones because there's different facets to transparency that map onto different parts of conducting research. Um, and so it's almost like, here, let's go back to this. So if we focus here on the five uh, transparency badges here, red, orange, blue, teal, green, um, Pre-registration is when you publicly pre-specify how you'll conduct the study and conduct the statistical analyses. And that, of course, prevents, uh, it prevents bias from creeping in after data collection. Um, study materials is making available all of the 
details and the materials like if you use photos or different stimuli all the recipes for you know chemical procedures so that you can do a replication right because again if you don't have enough details for other researchers to repeat the experiment or study then uh to be crude you're not doing science i mean it's not falsifiable uh and then there's the data so you conduct the study and then you have observations which tend to be in the form of spreadsheet or text files uh, these days so that's the data which means have you publicly posted the data on a repository and then code means the actual syntax or the statistical code used to run the statistical anal analyses on the data right and then the green badge is reporting standards that means you are reporting all of the details of your study sp specifically with respect to what methodologies you have used and also lumped in here is declaring your all funding sources any competing interests or conflicts of interest and the author contributions which means what did each author and co-author contribute to the manuscript which we'll we'll come back to why that's important and so in each one of these five categories there's been tons of developments so going back to pre-registration uh, you can pre-register at various spots including the osf as predicted.org offers a simpler eight question pre-registration um, and then other ones in political science i think called egap and one in uh, economics and then there's other ones for clinical like clinicaltrials.gov and and there's a longer list right and and this stems from we could briefly mention really a revolution that happened in medicine about 10 years before Daryl Bem it, because they kind of have their, had their own crisis earlier because of pharmaceutical companies uh, causing lots of harm with either bad drugs where they they're hiding side effects or just drugs that are ineffective which is also ethically questionable because then there's you could have been taking another medication that actually works so so medication that doesn't work for serious mental or physical conditions is is highly unethical so the pharmaceutical companies got caught and so all medical journals decided okay we need to now i think starting in the early 2000 all clinical trials had to be pre-registered for them to even be considered for publication so that's that was a major win that really um you could say was the the real beginning of the transparency movement in academic science it's just psychology had daryl bam in 2010 which then propelled propelled psychology into a transparency movement or even revolution as some people like to call it and so we tried to learn from them in a sense so for materials uh there's protocols.io which is more life sciences uh chemistry but it's really good so you can keep um you can upload like the 156 steps you need to prepare a cell lining for some kind of study on cells in biology or chemistry um and then you can link to it within the paper but as as we'll see we, we want to integrate all these integrations and then there's open source uh tools like psychopi and form r and open sesame where you can code your study using open source tools which is the ultimate transparency because then anyone can download and and have access to the open source program 
use to conduct your study, right? Most uh, programs these days, including the programs we use in grad school, they were proprietary, meaning you need a license, like $150 per year or something, right? So that means if other labs trying to do a replication of your paper don't have that license, they have to reprogram your entire experiment in a different experimental software. And then you can make mistakes or introduce other deviations, which makes replication even more difficult. And it's already difficult enough. So that's the, the future. In, um, but, but being transparent and posting your proprietary experimental files, that's still an improvement. So anything counts these days. But we'll see. The standards should be further raised in the, in the future. So for data, I mean, there's just an innumerable number of data repositories where you can post your data, including, again, OSF, Figshare, Dryad, Dataverse, Zenodo. Uh, I mean, there's, there's government ones. There's university data repositories. It, the list goes on. And though I still think there's, there should be... Um, they're all... I mean, I have, I guess, high user interface standards, but there's still room for a lot of improvement in the user experience of these data repositories. Where, for example, specifically, as we'll see, uh, we want better embeddedness. So post a data set, kind of looks like a spreadsheet, but you want to be able to deliciously embed it elsewhere, including places like Curious Science, to make it easier for the reader, the consumer of science, to be able to literally jump into your data set. <laughs> Dive in. Uh, and then for code, there's all these new innovative ways to uh, upload your code and your statistical analyses into the cloud so that other people can literally um, Oh, I should try to show that in the demo. Can can literally re-execute the statistical analyses on the data, which is also in the cloud. And so you can do reproductions in the cloud directly from an article. And that's also the future, the future future. So there's Code Ocean, Jupyter. Uh, well, GitHub allows you to post code. It doesn't really allow you to do it analyses in the cloud um, but there's other many other options um, and uh, and then reporting standards uh, mostly through the Equator network um, they have over 400 different uh, checklists kind of like your pilot has to check off things that he checked uh, where you just have to check and indicate where you describe a certain methodological detail about your study. And they're different for different fields, right? Animal studies have different checklists than in uh, neuroscience. And uh, psych disclosure was part of it in terms of popularizing the 21-word disclosure, which we talked about which was the main inspiration. And now we're calling it the basic three. Well, part of the Ecuador formal checklists, they include, I think, two of, of these three. But we're saying at the minimum, minimum, if you don't have anything, not even the basic four, which is the 21 word disclosure, you should have at least the basic three, right? And this would apply even to non-empirical papers. Uh, where well, there's no data, but you should still always declare author contributions, competing interests, and funding sources uh, because you need to know what are the potential outside financial influence because science, again, everyone's already biased enough, but if, if all of a sudden you're making even only a few hundred thousand dollars per year based on studies in that paper, then you need to disclose it. Let other people decide um, the merit of, of the work. But you need to provide 
these crucial pieces of information. Um, oh, and then, excuse me. And then even more excitingly is the open access revolution, which again, tons of new platforms, uh, like preprints.org bioarchive, which stems from the original archive.org started in physics and um, math uh, associated with Cornell and OSF preprints. <clears throat> and again, now a lot of universities have their own preprint server, and really anyone really can uh, have their own preprint server, which to clarify means it's a working paper that's not necessarily peer reviewed yet, but once you public, I mean, this is the, the, the beauty of the internet is literally the moment you publish, you publicly post something, uh, then anyone can comment and write a comment or peer review it in, in, the, in the sense of the word. So the, the preprint kind of new culture helps a lot in that way, but it also it was kind of a partial solution to the the evil publishers blocking access is that people would post a non-formatted version of the accepted manuscript. So in that sense, it's not really a preprint anymore. It's more of a uh, unformatted postprint. So the postprint would be the official version, i.e., uh, I should show you an example. La, 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 la. Okay. So if we go, oh, I didn't switch this to my author page so a preprint would be something like this EOSF sometimes is slow well in this case we kind of fancied it up or one of my co-authors fancied it up Right, but you can tell it's not the official version. I mean, it, it just looks like you create it in Word or in LaTeX. Right, the official version would look like this, right? Or we can even zoom in. And then here you can see both the, uh, the professional. So in this case, this is what we were talking about last time is that the this is the professional society association for psychological science who owns this journal which is called advances in methods and practices in psychological science that's the name of the journal but somehow the publisher sage sage is a for profit publisher Ooh. and why you know so they somehow uh, own the journal that is operated by the professional society and there's other societies who got smarter and decided no we're just going to control our own journal so jdm i think judgment and decision making they have their own society their own journal i mean they have a very simple low-tech website but at least the stuff is there it's open access for everyone forever always been you know but um, so anyway, so this is the, the, the post print, which is, you know, nicer, supposed to be nicer, which it is, but it's still, again, a static PDF that should be a thing of the past. I mean, PDF is for print. It's not meant for digital web content, which is, can be interactive 
and um, syncable, embeddable, uh, interactable. Anyways, it's a long list. <laughs> so the the and again, the, the open access. The idea is that in a few years, or maybe ten, but hopefully two to five years, open access will be legislated by governments um, and all governments. I mean, it'd be easier if you could just have some ultra or extra international legislation that would just apply to all countries because then the publishers might move their operations to countries where it's still legal to imprison publicly funded knowledge and then pay for access to it. But that's another dystopia, maybe. Um, so we'll go back to the... Diagram. The uh, so those are the the main fundamental categories of transparency. Again, pre-registration, materials, data, code, reporting standards, and then open access though to me this is not even a category because again this should never have been non-open access i mean it's a problem that should have been solved 20 years ago <clears throat> so i don't really count it but it is something we need to keep track of and as we saw last time according to current estimates or from four years ago um only about half of papers in social sciences are open access currently whether I think, oh no, that doesn't count Sci-Hub. No, I think that's not using Sci-Hub. With Sci-Hub, it's actually closer to 97%. But now certain governments, including Belgium, are blocking Sci-Hub servers, even though Belgium has a law that forces researchers to violate their copyright law to make their publicly funded research open access. Maybe that was part of the deal with the publishers. Anyways, so, and again, this is very exciting, but at the end of the day, for both researchers, ourselves, and for the public and all stakeholders, what you want is not all of this mess where you just know, okay, there's more transparency now, more than ever, a little bit more. How much more, we're not sure, but we just want a simpler system where we have standards and then a paper meets the standard or not. And um, so it would look something like this. And this is building off, we're, we're standing on the shoulders of giants which is why the different standards we're dedicating them to some of the pioneers that are literally at the forefront of pushing transparency standards and and embodying and actually implementing higher transparency standards but we want at the very least, a minimum standard. And so by the minimum standard, this means that a paper meets four requirements. That's it. Uh, publicly available data, publicly available study materials, and publicly available code, if applicable. And then at least the basic three reporting standards, which again are declaring conflicts of interest, funding sources, and author contributions. That's it. And, and notice that the, the last 
requirement. That applies even to non-empirical, even non-scientific works, if you think about it. So even if you're in English and you're writing an essay or you're writing a book, right, you still want to declare those three things for any scholarly content, really. And that's the minimum standard. And I have this other graph maybe of, of, of targets, because now that you're getting more specific, you can then set targets that, okay, by 2025, what percentage of articles do we hope meet the minimum standard, the curate science starter standard? I guess I didn't um, explicitly state the name of the standard. <clears throat> which would build off the Hardwick estimates that we reviewed, which were, I think, about only 20%. Oh, yeah, no, it was 20% data, 20% study materials, 3% code, and close to zero for reporting standards, right? Can we get those numbers up to 80%? Oof. <laughs> in five years. And again, as we'll see, I'm making a bold recommendation, potentially, that if, if researchers and universities don't meet this minimum standard, then maybe their funding should be pulled. And we'll come back to that. And so, so this, again, would be a minimum standard. Uh, you could raise the standard a little bit by requiring additional items, such as only using recognized repositories and data codebook, uh, which is just another file that describes each variable in a data set. Right? And that is part of the Center for Open Science, their top guidelines. They have, they have this grid that helped journals and they have all thousands of journal signatories that that have signed on but it's a very weak commitment they've just signed on that they might do something about transparency at some point in the future and they have this grid and it's a bit too complicated hard to follow but it's a stepping stone and we built from the we took directly from the top guidelines and just simplified things in terms of standards, which is just what requirements do you need for what standard. And so, for example, you can keep going and then say, okay, on top of all these things, uh, we want studies to be pre-registered. And this is could be one of at least one study or all studies in a paper because... Sometimes papers report only one study, or sometimes two, or three, or even six. So we'd have to, uh, we're going with at least one. This is the official standard, but these standards can change. And we're dedicating it to the Laura and John Arnold Foundation, who, who uh, have a document called something, Transparency Expectations for their grantees. They're a nonprofit in the U.S. And, you know, this is, to our knowledge, the uh, the granting agency that that requires the highest transparency standard though in communication with them they don't have a system to actually ensure it and somehow didn't seem interested in our using our system which though that was two years ago and it wasn't really uh, ready but uh, let's not get into that but uh, they so they, but at least that's their expectation. They don't check, I guess. They don't have a way of ensuring it, but it's still a beginning. And uh, and then you can go higher. And uh, so this is metapsychology, which is a meta science in journal in mostly made of psychologists slash meta scientists. But they accept, <coughs> excuse me, they accept. Uh, papers from the social sciences broadly and they to our knowledge have the highest transparency 
standards and they actually require it so that they um, if you want to be considered for publication and then if your paper is empirical or even simulation based they will independently reproduce it before publication and they also require open peer review which we alluded to last time which again one day we should track this separately really see what percentage of journals have open peer review and right now it's probably no it's definitely less than one or two percent not even one percent and we'd like to see that again in the 70 or 80 percent within five to ten years because again there are no counter arguments well we can go through a few we have time the only v even half reasonable concerns about open peer review is that it could disadvantage junior researchers younger researchers who would be afraid to question a senior re senior researcher due to fear that the senior researcher would unfairly treat them in the future so that's a very long sentence but um but my but i don't think that's a reasonable counter argument or, or compelling because in an open system the senior researcher can only unfairly target you by rejecting your paper for example in a closed system right because when you open it up it, it forces everyone to be accountable because if a senior researcher even as a, as an editor uh rejects a paper unreasonably then in an open system that would not fly unless they just desk reject it so maybe that is uh the only valid concern is that they can they could desk reject you <clears throat> but again i mean th there's always going to be desk rejections and so right even if you're if even if i generously give you that one it's still a small small cost compared to the incredible benefits and large benefits of open peer review like we said last time or previously uh it doesn't just make each review at each round more accountable and reasonable because you know your, your name's attached to it and it's going to be publicly posted so that all researchers including the public can see it but on top of that it, it accelerates science and efficiency because often there are details very useful details in the peer reviews themselves that are not part of the official paper which can be used for reanalyses, for extensions, for replications, new ideas. It's a, it's a gold mine. Actually, we had a few papers where the reviews were longer than the paper itself because it was a short report at Psych Science. And literally, I should stop saying that. Um, the reviews and the three rounds of reviews totaled something like 15 pages, and the manuscript was only five pages. And I have them. Actually, this is a debate I could briefly mention is now that open peer review is catching on, at least in a few journals, plus one just started as well. People are asking, well, is it ethical to retroactively publish, publish, publicly post your peer reviews if you've kept them, which I have. Well, I had to go back through old emails. It took a while. And some most people think no, because the peer reviewers were under the expectation that your re reviews would not be publicly posted. Uh, so my solution is, okay, well, you can redact, I mean blank, just remove the, the names of the reviewers, though they're already mostly anonymous. And then you can remove the name of the editor and then publicly post. And some people on Twitter, the, the minority, but it's still a sizable minority, said, yeah, that's the right thing to do. 
And that's a lot of work that was done for free. So if it can benefit anyone, and you'll see it's one of the metadata fields in Curate Science, hidden away. I mean, it's a secondary piece of information, but it's still good to link to it. Okay, so that's the highest standard because it has the largest number of transparency requirements. And I mean, we even have a 2025 horizon standard, which would go even further by requiring interactive charts and interactive data. And, uh, but, you know, we don't want to, I mean, maybe for the younger generation, we want to give them something even higher to strive for. Because at that point, it's not even just transparency, it's, it's accessibility. And it has a lot more impact, um, not just for the community of scientists, but also for the public. Again, especially for psychology and fields that are more popular, more interesting to the general audience, you can really increase the impact of your research if you make your data not just publicly posted, but interactable and easily accessible, right? I mean, it really increases the return on investment by a lot. So it's, it, so eventually it, it, it's, you're going beyond transparency and, and entering more into accessibility. But, but right now the focus is on like thinking, okay, what are the minimum standards? And let's just all meet a minimum standard and then we really gain a lot relative to the cost. Because of course, with more requirements, it's more cost. And most academics are already short on time. So they don't have more, they already don't have enough time to do opaque science. <laughs> they barely have time to do the minimum standard. And if anything, in several presentations I've given, people will uh, complain that even the minimum standard is fairly onerous. And it, again, um, given you're a publicly funded researcher, if you can't spend five minutes, literally this should take you no more than five minutes to post this information using any tool you want. So you have to think about that. Are you really saying that as a public professional, a public scientist, <laughs> that you don't have five minutes to publicly post a de-identified, anonymized data set. And actually, this is not even raw data. We didn't mention that. It gets a bit boring. But in data, you're talking about raw data, which is the actual data that was outputted by your program that was collecting the data. But of course, once you have raw data, you have to usually clean it, organize it, transform it into a form that you can then do your analyses. That's called processed data. And for this badge, including even all of these, even the higher transparency standards, only the transformed data is required. None of these standards require raw data. though. That could be part of a higher standard. You could decide, okay, now you have to post raw data. But raw data is a lot larger and it carries potentially more risks of sensitive privacy issues. So for now, again, just focus on transform data. As long as you can go from the transform data, apply the statistical analyses, and arrive at the same results, then you're good. It's withstood scrutiny. And that's a good segue to get into credibility, maybe. Or do we want to jump into the demo? Uh, no, I think we'll go into credibility. So Again, this is 
So the new tools, again, we're reviewing new tools and standards to increase transparency and credibility or uh, replicability. So the second part of the, or the second side of the coin is credibility, which in our organization, in the article card that organizes all of the basic article metadata, you have transparency and then you have credibility to the right. Oh, and I should briefly mention that the icon to the left of the transparency badges indicate what transparency standard the article meets, which in general is all you care about. So now you just, you're looking at papers, you're not counting the number of badges and doing all this stuff. You're just looking, oh, okay, this paper meets the LJAF standard. And then you, we will learn uh, that the rough ordering of, of standards. So you should at least always expect a snail because the snail tells you it meets the minimum standard. If you see OSF, LJAF, or metapsychology, then you know, okay, it's slightly higher. I don't really care that much, but as long as there's the, a snail at minimum, right? So very simple. And then if there's a problem, well, people could say flag issue, this, does not appear to meet the requirement or whatever. I mean, but again, people are not going to be lying <laughs> about transparency, though maybe we should be worried. But um, I think I pointed out that uh, lying about transparency is going to ruin your reputation. And if anything, it actually could be considered misconduct in a sense, because lying about something so fundamental to science as transparency should, should be considered more egregious. And, and again, there's going to be bad apples who are going to lie, but those are psychopaths that are less than one or 2%. And, uh, and then fraud is five to 10%. And again, this is why we have replication, which is where we're going. So transparency is the minimum standard, because with transparency, you can properly evaluate credibility, which is do the findings withstand scrutiny? Because now, because you have enough information, you can read it carefully, really scrutinize it for fatal flaws and other limitations. And you can do, you can, um, do a reproduction, which is repeating <clears throat> repeating the uh, uh, analyses on the data and ensuring you get the same results, right? And this sounds straightforward, but we now know from other metascientific evidence that uh, across areas, uh, usually not the majority, less than 50% of papers who reproduce the same analyses get the same results, including even in computer science field, which is Pretty embarrassing. But again, computer scientists in academia operate under the same flawed incentive structure. So it's not that surprising. Um, but it's still a bit surprising given that computer science should be pretty good at posting their code and maybe using these uh, code capsules. And so, but part of credibility is also just critical commentaries. So uh, you can add comments to, you can link comments that have been made about a paper, including from PubPeer. Um, and, and then you can see, okay, some people seem to have issue with this problem, but then the author seemed to address it. There's often back and forth. And these kinds of comments, whether they're formally published or on a blog post, are really similar to what happens in peer review. So this is what some people are call, calling post-publication peer review, and which what I call the perpetual post-publication peer review, if that's not alliterative enough for you. 
uh, the PPPPR, right? Because it's a perpetual activity of science to scrutinize and re-scrutinize and to reevaluate and to re-dissect. Uh, because sometimes you, you really miss something that's just it's just there and you just didn't see it. You didn't see that problem or you didn't see an opportunity or a new insight or a new clue that you can test in a subsequent experiment. Uh, and then you get replication where you repeat the study again, hopefully you can go directly from the study materials. You repeat the experiment in a new sample of participants or animals or carbon atoms and hope to get similar results. And so you can link replications of studies reported in the paper and then have them all organized and keep track of them. And a few things to clarify, but again, replication is a minimum standard. It doesn't mean that, okay, your papers or your study replicates, therefore you've discovered the truth forever. No, it's a minimum standard that that ensures that if someone else tries to repeat it, they'll get something similar. There, there'll be an expectation of getting something similar that you can build upon. You can probe further for validity of the instruments, validity of the manipulation, maybe the generalizability. You want to see if it generalizes to other cultures, other languages. Uh, maybe you want to test a mechanism. So. There's an effect there, but how does it work? Through what mechanism does the phenomena emerge? Right? And so transparency in, ensures credibility, but credibility is just a minimum step for having some solid enough foundation to build your house upon, your house of knowledge. So... <clears throat> yeah, so, and, and so we have all these new tools, and because you can do reproducibility in a code ocean capsule, you can uh, do robustness. Oh, we didn't mention that one. So another one, uh, so reproducibility is repeating the same analyses on the data set uh, or you can go, you repeat the analyses on the data set and hope to get similar results or confirm that you get the same results. Um, but you can also do something called robustness reanalysis or in economics they call it sensitivity analysis, which is to probe, as the name implies, the sensitivity of the results. Meaning if you, if you do different analyses that are also justifiable on the data, do you get similar results, right? Because if you can only get your results using a specific set of analyses that are justifiable, but then there's all these other ways to do the analyses that are also justifiable that don't give the results, then that means you might have cherry picked the analyses that gave the best results. Whether you cherry pick that intentionally or not, doesn't matter. And, but as you can see, things are a bit scattered. Um, and so, Curate Science in its Grand Vision platform is to integrate these tools and new standards into an integrated system that can be used by all research stakeholders in a simple, integrated, seamless fashion through just using modern web, open API, embeddable technology, um, which is just really catching up to where most of the rest of society already is. In every other aspect of society, um, the modern web has really transformed our lives in terms of digital modern web technology solutions. Um, and so Curate Science just puts this together and comes up with 
a user-friendly, simple way to organize all of the key pieces of information, but it's organized through the transparency standards and linking to credibility. I mean, that's really all it is, and, and you can fill more or less information that you want. Uh, and then you can organize your articles into your own author page, uh, a free forever author page, which allows you the best way, the most deliciously user-friendly way to organize your publication list so that others can consume your scientific products in an accessible, simple, delightfully delicious way, right? Because again, the, the purpose of science is wide dissemination so that it can have a maximum impact and so that other people cannot just benefit from your scientific information, but they can build upon it and other people can repurpose it for an unknown, innumerable different number of ways. And, and this uh, author page is embeddable. And so you can, uh, let's see here, there you go. And so just like YouTube or Google Maps, you can embed your content anywhere you want, whether it's your blog, your university profile page, or your own website, right? So in this case, this would be the website, whoops. And then you could just embed your publication list and you could customize it and show it in different ways. Um, and there's a filter to search. Well, well I'll sh give you a quick demo. Um, and then once you're organized your publication, they're not just embeddable anywhere, but wherever they have been embedded, uh, whether it's a journalist or by the journal, when you update information at one place, it syncs everywhere. So the information is synced everywhere. So that would mean that if you publicly post your data, for example, then all the other places where your article is embedded, that information is automatically updated. Or if you improve the figures and add a more delicious interactive figure uh, or a interactive HTML version of your article, right? Those will be synchronized and, and uh, automatically across the different contexts in which your research appears. So, yeah, we'll talk about, we'll go back to uh, replication collections. And then journals will be able to, oh yeah, and all these are, will, are they deliciously scale on any device size, including tablet, smartphone, it's touch enabled, it's already as, well, you can't see, but I'm, using my touchscreen laptop to interact with the page. And um, you'll see in the demo, it's uh, pretty neat. And this is also trying to stay ahead of the future of an increasing number of people will be using touch enabled tablets and desktops and even large screen is the future of academics interacting with scientific content in a large display touchscreen. So this will be available for uh, app and Mac uh, products. Like, um, well, it'll be more likely to be kind of like a iPad Pro times two, right? And so you can have an app from the iTunes store to interface with curated science content. But of course you could do it from the web or anywhere else. And so journals could use our transparency system to ensure that submitted articles meet 
a minimum transparency standard and they could choose which standard they want and then maybe rise increase it over time but in this case we already mentioned meta psychology they have the highest standard currently and so they could use um they could embed uh their published content using our article card technology and the transparency system which of course would show that okay each of their articles meet their own very high standard but of course this means that other journals can uh, decide to require the meta psychology standard and yeah we had feedback that maybe this should be a different name so that people aren't confused that you know if you're a journal in nutrition right it might be confusing that a journal in nutrition is using a transparency standard with the name meta psychology anyways this is a small point um and then again this is not just the transparency part which is crucial here that journals can ensure but it makes them accountable to what they publish because if someone links to a critical commentary that kind of debunks a paper then you know this will be uh this will be potentially embarrassing for the journal so they then are held more accountable to trying to publish higher quality papers and to to scrutinize papers a bit more cuz also reanalyses reproductions or or other independent rep reproductions or robustness analyses or replications would also be automatically linked so if someone adds a replication of this paper on cured science then the next time this journal's article list is refreshed that will appear here right because this is a big problem uh is that journals have immense power because in academia getting published in the top journals even just two or three times can be the difference between getting a tenure track job for life and not so there's a lot on the line and and again some of these editors are still the elite editors that are not necessarily on board with higher transparency standards and this is again but but even with the best intention editors right which is most editors there needs to be a mechanism to hold a journal accountable to what they publish but also then we have a way to rank journals more objectively which is what you could do once this our system is scaled up well i can let you <coughs> is that you can then start ranking or at least rough rankings of what are the most transparent journals and and transparency uh, indirectly or can be used as a rough proxy for credibility because at least it gives you more chance to be accountable right because if you're not even transparent then it'd be almost impossible to uh refute anything that's published except for critical commentaries but again oh that should be mentioned is and this is i was implicated in, in criticizing jpsp well that i already mentioned that and got backlash from senior people saying oh you're personally attacking the editor of jpsp but i wasn't i was just pointing out that he's not willing to publish replications which is ridiculous after the Daryl Bam incident especially jpsp <laughs> and this is what some journals are doing now it's called the pottery pottery barn rule that if you publish something you are uh kind of uh, are required to publish any replication results of the study you published and it's from a metaphor of you break it you pay for it right 
you're kind of responsible. If something breaks, then you have to let your readers know. And that's how you gain credibility. How can you be a credible journal if you're just publishing sexy, flashy stuff and then when it doesn't replicate, you don't even tell your readers? Well, that's called a magazine. That's called uh, storytelling. That's not science. And, and so... And so this way, even if a journal doesn't agree to publish replications, uh, you could still go to Curate Science and, and see if it's, something's been posted there, right? And this is actually Metapsychology, the journal itself often ends up publishing commentaries and replications that other journals don't want to publish, even though it's, it, it was about findings and papers they previously published, right? So that goes to show, again, how we still broke 10 years after BAM, there's still journals that refuse to publish commentaries critical of their own articles and refuse to publish negative replication results or any replication results because uh, it's true that they should also publish positive replication results. It should not be about the outcome of the results. Because uh, then you will incentivize uh, negative replication results. So then there could be what's been called p-squashing or null hacking, where you're deliberately trying to get nothing. I mean, that would be that be again that'd be fraudulent if you're doing replication results and um, cooking the books in the opposite direction, then that's also fraud. And uh, Oh, and I forgot to mention, this is why you need an integrated system, because even with minimum transparency standards, you'll still get 1% to 5% bad apples who are committing fraud. And that's where you turn to replication, because with a crowdsourced replication system like here at Science, uh, if someone's being transparent but fraudulent, uh, eventually, as long as there's independent replications from enough different labs, you will triangulate towards the truth. And so, so the system is would even be foolproof or fail-proof, rather, against fraud unless there's orchestrated co coordinated fraud like a lab ring <laughs> right but then this would be kind of the the most epic fraud heist of all time if you had though it's possible and again the stakes are really high right now i mean i would not I'd, it'd be shocking and surprising but i would not be that surprising if it came out that several different labs coordinated a fraud by pretending to successfully replicate each other's results, but in a coordinated fashion. So that'd be the only instance that the system would fail. Um, but uh, that's still hopefully not very likely. So, and But there could be ways around it. Because if those labs are coordinated, their attack, they probably are linked financially somehow. So you could look at the, the network. This is, would be maybe a computer science problem where, and again, you have the funding sources, right? So with the minimum transparency standard, now you can analyze the different way the labs, the different ways the different labs funding sources overlap and then have to account for that in when you're rep, when you're interpreting replications. Oh, and this would be a good segue to go show replication collections. So the uh,
the replication collections would show you for a specific effect so this from education whether longhand note writing versus laptop affects learning because there was this idea that taking notes on a laptop is less effective for learning than handwriting either because of the distractions and or the consolidation in memory and now there's replications of this that are not working out which suggests well maybe laptops aren't that bad after all and or it could be the other way around too um sorry the claim was that longhand is more effective than laptop but then the replications aren't finding much difference at all between the two but then i saw there's um a newer design that did it within subjects so tracking participants tracking students over time for like eight months where you track their quizzes uh and then the results seem more promising that longhand does provide an average benefit across students and the results seem to be supported even in the independent replications though the transparency of the replication studies in some cases are unclear unknown and so this is called the replication collection you can you can evaluate replication evidence you can track it you can be notified if new replications are uh, added and this is crowdsourced so any logged in user can add replication information well as long as you're a researcher because unlike wikipedia you do need to be uh, a researcher to be able to add information because it's you need to make sure that the replications are sufficiently methodologically similar and then a note and that they're testing the same hypothesis using the same operationalizations and measurement the devices and then noting the differences and then other information related to assumptions that are assumed to even be able to test the hypothesis and and the, the sky's the limit here too in terms of um, other features you could implement for the citizens that could be interested for personal reasons you might be interested in meditation the effects of meditation or specific diet for a digestion problem so you could go on here and and find uh, highly credible evidence but also to track evidence over time for new experimental uh, tests of medical procedures and uh, be notified and even maybe request replication so often there'll be promising studies that are found but then they need to do replications you could use this system to then share by saying okay we want replications of this promising treatment for this rare kind of leukemia uh, and then you can share it on social media and get other people to also indicate that they would like to see a replication or a set of replications be done and then it could help researchers decide oh the public actually seems to be really interested in these studies we should do those studies or even go to the funder as we talked about previously and then the funder could allocate research specifically dedicated to replication and then do the replications that are most relevant to the largest number of people in the public in the community i mean that's like it's almost like direct democracy but for science direct science it's almost participatory science as part of the broader citizen science movement i guess so so that's part of the the, the grand vision platform that's being built uh, but we need a lot more help and we need a lot more resources and so um, we are in a funding campaign in the beginning of it uh, to raise a second round of funding for our efforts and um, so and we will be contacting 
uh, we are contacting and we will be contacting hundreds of new stakeholders and uh, constituents who could benefit from this system. Again, both in terms of uh, the transparency and um, just the credibility part. So uh, actually we can go back here. Uh, yeah. And then this is, again, in the context of a global movement. I mean, the, the, the open science movement is a rapidly growing movement that's spreading globally. Uh, there's this list that Brian Nosek started, and there's over 225 grassroots open science initiatives all around the world tackling different parts of open science or just having conferences, having meetings, having open science center in, in Germany and in, in Switzerland, uh, in the Netherlands, uh, in Australia. I mean, it's just spreading everywhere uh, as a general awakening of, the, of kind of seeing the new vision of uh, you're doing publicly funded research. It better be more transparent and it better be accessible and reusable. Um, and so the system we're developing it is, is developed to be an integrated system that can serve all of the different stakeholders in a seamless, user-friendly and least bureaucratic way as possible. And so, and again, this starts with um, the individual researcher. So you create your own author page. We'll give a brief demo. Um, so every researcher can create their own free forever author page and indicate which transparency, whether they meet the minimum transparency standard, and then not only benefit from that, but make their papers more organized, more accessible, and more deliciously consumable for everyone. So that helps not just your own colleagues, your own fellow scientists in the community, but also anyone, any doctor, any public citizen, any journalist, government analyst, NGO, nonprofit, the list goes on of people that rely on science to learn, to develop products, develop innovations, treatments, anything. Uh, the list goes on. And another new standard to mention is improved statistics and methods training. And that's happening in different ways all around the world, both in terms of maybe requiring higher math degrees or, or higher math, mathematics requirements even to get into a graduate program like a master's program. Uh, and or just offering a larger number of statistics courses that are more hands-on, more concrete, use more simulations. And methods training is, is how to design a study. Because again, you can have the best statistics, but if you're still using between subjects designs where you're averaging across humans, that's not going to get us very far, no matter how transparent your research is or replicable. And so these more advanced within-person designs are also what's known as, as highly repeated within-person designs uh, is really the future of being able to understand the psychology of individuals in different contexts and then looking for clusters of individuals who are reacting or behaving homogeneously and then uh, keeping those clusters separated because if you average across different kinds of people different kinds of mechanisms uh, you're not going to make much progress and and that's it. So basically just meeting a, a minimum transparency standard is the best an individual can do to 
to minimize the chance of fooling themselves so that they minimize the chance of fooling others, right? But it's just minimized. You're never going to eliminate bias, no matter how transparent the standards are. And, and that's where credibility and independent verification comes in. Uh, and so just having minimum standards uh, really buys us a lot. And so as we saw at journals, the system can also be used, the integrated system, for journals to not just require open access, but to actually link it directly from an article card and then uh, ensure that there's submissions meet a minimum transparency standard, again, with the CS theory science starter standard as the minimum standard. Uh, journals should also enforce the Pottery Barn rule, uh, which is publishing high quality replications of studies they've published and including publishing critical commentaries that find flaws in their papers or whether just through conceptual analysis or result reproducibility or robustness reanalyses. And then they can also offer registered reports which is peer reviewing a study before data collection. And then if accepted, the journal publishes the results no matter what. And that has a lot of benefits, though it does slow down research. Um, and um, But there are ways, um, which Chris Chambers is talking about, to maybe scale up this concept. And when he was visiting, we talked about kind of a crowd sourcing model of registered reports, which to me is, is even more exciting or promising, where you could post a pre-registered design of a study and how you're going to analyze the data. And then you publicly post it for the community, right? Somewhere on Curate Science or any public platform. And then you have to try to solicit comments from the community using social media or other channels. And then it could be a system where if you manage to get three reviewers that are arm's length independent, which again we mentioned is not having co-authored a paper with someone else, right? Or family blood ties, I guess. Um, then if you find three reviewers to review it and then request revisions, then you make the revisions, you update the pre-registration, and then you get the green light to do the study. And then those can be published and and labeled and then and then you could search and start analyzing data and only data that that were using a registered report format where you can be absolutely certain that there's no cherry picking of studies uh, though there can still be some cherry picking at the analysis stage um, but that depends on the specific the specificity of the pre-registration protocol, but that's the general idea. Um, but again, at, at minimum, you want journals to ensure that their papers meet a minimum transparency standard and that they take an oath of some kind that they will publish uh, follow-up critical work on anything they've previously published. Uh, and then universities, oh yeah, we have to go back. Uh, very straightforward, again, they can just ensure that all, all professors, all staff, all researchers meet the, a minimum transparency standard. Um, and I have a prototype of this. Here, 
And again, this would be seamlessly embedded into whatever system they have, though I've been learning recently that they often are using open systems with open standards that could you just hook them up and, and integrate our systems together. And most universities, they have a website with the department website that lists the authors, or rather the professors. And so again, they could all be integrated where you click on a researcher's name and you see straight from a employee list or faculty list uh, what percentage of their articles meet a certain minimum standard. So in this case, 100% of her five publications meet the LJAF standard, which is a pretty high standard. Um, and it's not about counting and splitting hairs. It's just, okay, you have this track record and it, it means something. Oh yeah, and, and we'll mention in the author page when I demo it, is that you could also show a researcher's transparency track record over time to at least say, okay, you're at least improving. You had only you know 10% of articles meeting a minimum transparency standard in 2020, but now five years later, you're up to 60%. So at least you're going in the right direction. We're not saying necessarily we need to demand 100% transparency tomorrow uh, and radical transparency we're, we're saying a gradual shift towards minimum transparency and and again this is this is not just benefiting the university for transparency compliance this is again making the research outputs of your employees maximally accessible and user-friendly right because then people checking out the university website can easily dive in and start consuming and interacting with professors research uh, in a very delicious and user-friendly ways and and then oh, we'll go back to and then the other issues we mentioned is enhanced fraud investigation procedures, which we won't cover. That would have to be some other body. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know, that's government stuff. I guess they give out licenses. If you want to be a non-profit institution, or, or rather a, a post-secondary university institute, there's got to be requirements and having fraud investigation procedures like we said you have to uh, compile every complaint from anyone about possible fraud has to be compiled and any audit any investigation of a possible fraud needs to be publicly posted within a certain amount of time something like that and it would be part of i guess government regulation though again it'd be better to have these standards at the ultra national level so that we don't different countries and different universities don't have to reinvent the wheel right every time and then sounder evaluation criteria for hiring and promotion and again that to us just stems from well just look at their transparency track record you could say and this is already happening at uh, lmu and other dutch universities primarily where they're they are starting to consider okay how much how many papers have you posted data for how many papers are open access and things like that and so again with our system you could you'll be able to easily tell uh a researcher's track record and what minimum standard they're meeting and how that's in increasing over time and 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 so you, that would be part of whether you get a job, whether you get a promotion, whether you even get tenure, um, and whether you get grants, which is this final uh, area where they do need to consider other things like publication track record and, and your impact. But 
they should also take into consideration um, your transparency track record again. Same, same idea. And that would look like what I already showed you accidentally. Uh, so every public funding agency has a website and we could show you, it's pretty sad, and they'll show you who they've given money to, what years, and all the amounts. But they don't show you what publication has come out of this $500,000 grant and what standards do those publications meet. And so the idea would be, again, using our integrated system, they could decide, okay, all grants in Canada from now on need to meet the minimum transparency standard. And when you go to the grants database page, the public taxpayer can literally see exactly what publications came out of which grant and, and have access to it and be able to not just see the full text, uh, the key figures that actually have access to the data if it's uh, allowed to be publicly released. And it's already part of, in Canada at least, uh, an open government, open data movement to publicly make accessible as much government information as possible as long as it's not violating privacy rights. Um, and, and Canada has been talking about it, but um, again, I'll be emailing you, you, <laughs> local politicians and other Ottawa people to try to at least get something in this direction, at least get some uh, partnership or some kind of agreement to collaborate on uh, making this happen. Uh, the technology is there. Uh, it, it, the hardest part is, is the social and the bureaucratic part, I guess, in a large-scale institution. Uh, but in Canada, at least it's smaller than in the U.S. So maybe we actually have a better chance at instituting change faster and, and just saying, um, this just needs to happen, 2025. And again, this will be integrated. So from the researcher's perspective, um, you'd have to only do this once. Yeah, this is worth mentioning. So if we go back to the journal, this would be a typical workflow. You have a paper, you write it up, and then you submit to a journal. And then you submit to a journal, which then tells you, okay, you need to meet this minimum transparency standard, let's say the CS starter. So you do it, okay, it takes you five, 10 minutes, it's annoying, but you do it, you meet the standard, and then once the paper's accepted, uh, the system is integrated. So it automatically, uh, the university system will automatically know that you have a new paper and that you're already meeting the standard that they require which could be different from what the funder requires. And so the, the researcher would only be notified if for some reason the funder required a higher transparency standard. Um, but if they all require the same standard, or if you, they require different standards and you're already meeting them, then your job's done. You just move on, right? So it's, it's the simplest, uh, most user-friendly way to just ensure all research meets minimum transparency standards and is user-friendly across all contexts, whether your article is presented on the funder's page, on a journalist's page, on a blog post, uh, in Wikipedia. People can embed the article card anywhere, and the information is automatically synced and updated uh, forever. Actually, maybe I can show that. We should be wrapping up here. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think we're going to wrap up and do the demo tomorrow or in the next video. Um, yeah. Because our time is up. Our time is up. So I'll just show a few other ways the system, how the system will be integrated. 
Uh, let's see here. The and uh, oh yeah, so the I mentioned journalists. So this is what it could look like. It or not could, but it will. And so often, very often, um, you have a journal, journalist, scientist journalist like Ed Young, um, and they report on on new findings of this study in rats. You know, they might uh, lead to a cure for pancreatic cancer. But often they either don't link to the original article or they make it so hard to find. You have to click in this wild goose chase to track down the paper and then it's blocked and it's not open access or, you know. So the new standard for science journalism could be whatever, if you're ever reporting on a paper, you need to embed the Curate Science article card of that paper into your article. And if there are several, you can embed a list of two or three. And then uh, you could see that, okay, I don't just have access to the full text, but I'm seeing that the paper meets the minimum transparency standard and that the journalist is not exaggerating because that's often what happens. They exaggerate, misinterpret, overgeneralize what the scientists actually said in the paper. And then again, it keeps them accountable because if a year from now, replications are posted of this so-called groundbreaking finding, but the replications don't work out, then future readers of this report, journalist report, will be updated automatically uh, with replications that were posted later. So this keeps journalists accountable and keeps the public up to date. Um, because often you, you come to an article or blog post from five years ago and you have no way of, of easily knowing what the follow-up research since then has demonstrated. Uh, and there are millions of journalists, science journalists, uh, that could benefit from this. And, um, and then all kinds of other integrations. So... Um, well, this is another diagram I could have shown that it's just showing you how it's the same article card, right, that's being pulled in, in a sense. I mean, this is not how servers work, but uh, let me use my mouse here. So you can see uh, that even if the information is, is posted on Curate Science, um, then it can be embedded on an author's page, a university profile page, a journal page, funders page, uh, any article like we just saw. And then anytime the information is updated from anywhere, it's automatically synced back. And, and that's something even like you'll be able to uh, edit information even when it's embedded externally to the site. I mean, as long as you're logged in. But it would say, okay, you need to log in, and then you could sign up and or log in into Curate Science remotely. Anyways, um, and this is also showing that over time, um, you can curate more transparency over time. So maybe initially, let's say if the journal only required um, uh, two badges or whatever, but then over time, if the article garners interest, then people ask for the data, then the data is posted, uh, and then maybe the reporting standards is posted. And then the information is further curated, because then now that you have data, you can do a reproduction, and then you can post the reproduction results. Then you can post a critical commentary based on that reproduction, and so on. And so over time, um, the information is curated, 
but again, it remains synced across all the different contexts in which it's been embedded. And this also speaks to another point I don't think I mentioned, which is that, yes, transparency can be expensive. And that's, again, why you need minimum transparency standards first. And then if there's demand, you can strive for more transparency, right? Because, um, I mean, based on a principle, you could say, okay, we want minimum transparency standards. Um, but even if a paper does not meet the minimum transparency standard, only partial, right? If there's demand for it, then uh, there's more incentive to add transparency and contact the original authors. And then maybe they will have more motivation to post stuff if they realize that there's interest. Right, because now we're going to be faced with what do you do when you go down your list of publications, especially for the older stuff, right? Are you going to really spend, because with the older stuff, it does take longer. Are you going to spend half an hour trying to dig up the study materials and, and post it somewhere? Probably not. But if someone emails you, right, you'd be more likely to post it if you know it could end up on an integrated system that is integrated and embedded so that other people can benefit from it, right? And that's kind of like the open source philosophy of because you're doing it in an open source uh, public way, you are motivated to, to really do the, your best job because other people could build upon it. And, and you're, so there's both kind of the feeling of increased scrutiny that your code may get, but also that it has larger impact and can be reused more easily in much uh, wider context. So, um, but the other one was uh, Zotero integration. Uh, Let's uh, go back or anywhere. So we'll have plugins um, that can inject curious science transparency and credibility information for any matching uh, DOI. Yeah, that's not really worth. Oh, there it is. Oh, maybe. So, you know, this is what the science journal looks like. But if, um, so with a plugin, right, the plugin could detect the DOI and say, oh, it can pull up critical commentaries and replications of that article so that you could then hover over and, and directly see, ooh, there's, there's some replication difficulties there that I need to check in on. So again, so of course, the journal doesn't have to, and no, this is what it would be for. If the journal doesn't want to integrate the Curate Science system voluntarily, we can still kind of uh, impose that information onto them through these plugins, though it requires you to install the plugin, but it's um, if it becomes popular, kind of like Sci-Hub, then you know it could take kind of take them over, and eventually these journals they'll become obsolete um, potentially. And then this is the Zotero. Oh yes, dial-up internet. This is good. <laughs> we were having issues yesterday, I think. Um, so Zotero is one of the most popular, I guess, PDF, uh, reference managers, which also could become obsolete, I guess, one day, but not any day soon. And so the idea is that any, again, DOF, DOF, <laughs> DOI of a PDF that you have, um, uh, could automatically look up transparency and credibility information 
of that article and then display it and and then you could click on it to check out the information at Cured Science. I'm not sure if you could do hovers, interactive hover pop-ups. Depends on Zotero maybe, but um, and so it's it's ambitious, but this is all possible if you're using Open API modern web architecture, which we are, which has meant slower initial development, but it's uh, worth it in the end, in the long term. Okay, um, I think that does it. We're uh, went a bit longer than uh, expected and so overall again a lot of positive and exciting developments in terms of many new transparency tools new transparency standards systems to ensure research meets those minimum transparency standards but also to keep track of credibility which again it's Transparency allows proper scrutiny by independent peers. But then you need to organize and track that follow-up information into critical commentaries, reprodu reproduction analyses, robustness analyses, and replications. Um, and, and that keeps everyone accountable because already just transparency is scary because it means people can more properly scrutinize it. But transparency also means more diagnostic replications can be done, um, which, but again, if you, fail replications are going to be common. And if you react in a civilized, constructive fashion, then, then you know, th th it's not like your reputation is going to be ruined if, a few of your studies fail to replicate some of the time, right? Though, of course, if 90% of your studies are not replicating almost all of the time, then, you know, that becomes maybe more problematic. Um, but again, if you're using just basic transparency standards in your own lab, and you're using larger sample sizes, and you're using other tools to ensure high quality work, uh, then stuff will replicate. And again, um, a large minority of studies are replicating. It's more uh, about the size and generalizability, uh, but replicability is achievable. <laughs> and um, and so in, and in the final video, we'll, we'll go over more concrete demonstrations of how this system uh, looks like and how it actually works uh, in real time, or at least an early beta version of it. And then we'll, uh, we'll integrate and uh, summarize the broader picture and the broader movement. Okay, signing off. It's important that you, the taxpayer, engage with the videos to increase their visibility. So please like or dislike videos, leave a comment regarding points of clarification or other issues or topics you'd like us to cover. Leave comments pointing out any inaccuracies, mischaracterizations, errors. Finally, please consider making a donation so we can continue to create videos and achieve our goals of reforming research standards in academia. You can make a donation on our Patreon page, link to my left, or by making a one-time PayPal donation, link in the video description. Thank you.